Um, on to our second speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Anja Dahlmann, who is an associate at the, uh, uh, the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik in Berlin. Uh, she is principal researcher of the International Panel on the Regulation of Autonomous Weapons, uh, and in that capacity follows very closely the, uh, the lethal autonomous weapons debate, the laws debate, as they know, uh, at the UN. And her work includes or covers international arms control, emerging military technologies, and the respective German and European defence policy. In the note she sent, <coughs> sent around to us all on the panel just before, uh, just uh, earlier on this week, she said, my presentation will be a brief overview of autonomy in weapon systems. So good luck with that, Anya. <laughs> OK, just ah, perfect. Yes. So good morning, everyone. Um, very happy to be here. Um, and I will talk surprisingly about autonomous weapon systems. Um, I usually, or I basically always, uh, come from the lens of arms control on this issue. Mm. And I will do so today, but I won't really talk about the whole process of regulation that's going on at the United Nations, but more on the basics that we need before that, uh, which is the what and why. So what are we actually talking about when we talk about lethal autonomous weapon systems? And why are they so special? Why should we even bother? So the what. Um, there isn't really a common definition of autonomous weapon systems, but uh, for example, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, uh, has a definition, a working definition that says an autonomous weapon system is any weapon that can select and attack targets without human intervention. The US definition is quite uh, similar, actually. Um, and I think this working definition is quite helpful to narrow down what we're talking about. Any weapon that can select and detect targets, so we talk about functions. It's not about the whole weapon system, it's not about logistics or air-to-air uh, -air refueling capacities, but it's really about the functions in the targeting cycle. Targeting cycle being all those steps of, for example, find, fix, track, target and engage and assess afterwards. Um, so those functions we're talking about and autonomy uh, in those functions. I think that's a helpful concept to keep in mind here. Um, it gives us a clear pic picture that we not talk about humanoid killer robots, time traveling killer robots, I won't name it here. Um, but like, you know, elements um, in the targeting process. We also don't necessarily talk about a platform here. Um, you can have those autonomous functions everywhere in the targeting cycle and in, on basically any platform. It could be a drone, that's the image that usually comes to mind first if you don't think about the humanoid one. Um, it could be a submarine, it could be like a border patrol um, land robot or a border just a station uh, at the border, for example. It could be a battlefield management system. Uh, and you could basically put any kinetic weapon on it that you want. It could be nuclear. That might be a very bad idea, but you could do it. Um, it could be also hypersonic weapons, for example. So all these uh, uh, interesting, more or less new uh, technologies can be brought together as well. That's something to watch. Um, but if you look at this definition, it's quite broad, actually, and seems to include existing systems as well. We already have these air defense systems like CRAM. And, uh, there's one at sea, Phalanx, for example, that can uh, detect and uh, fight incoming munition to protect ships. Um, there are similar systems on land to protect, uh, um, what's the term? Well, to protect things on land. <laughs> Let's put it like this. Um, so if you want a regulation of these autonomous functions, you, you might need some caveats. Um, but it's probably quite obvious that we don't talk about landmines here, but about something that can act in more dynamic, cluttered environments, for example, that existing systems can't uh, at the moment. So functions is one part of the definition. There's another part to this. Um, any weapon that can select and attack targets without human intervention. And that's actually the most important thing, I think, here. Um, it's about the human-machine relation. It's not about all this discussion, what is autonomy, you know, in a technical sense, in a psychological sense, whatever. It's about the human-machine relation here. And that's a very fundamental question we have to answer if we talk about uh, regulation and autonomous functions here. 
Um, so um, it's yeah, not the autonomy definition, but the role of the human in warfare. And this relation, how can we, the question, how can we achieve a useful and safe uh, collaboration of humans and machines according to each, each uh, specific capabilities and functions? Um, for example, machines are much faster, they have much faster reaction times in certain contexts. <coughs> Excuse me. While uh, a human has, for example, a broader situational understanding, can understand context and attention, which machines can't. So when we talk about these functions, um, it's not like making everything autonomous and have this fully autonomous thing, but think about how can we bring humans and machines together and define the level of human control we need in there. Um, thinking about the human is one thing, but of course it's uh, important to, State Secretary said it, to understand the technology behind this. And the enabling technology behind autonomous functions is, for example, first of all, hardware. You need sensors, you need processors and all this and software. Um, and there it becomes interesting because there are those, all those new interesting uh, opportunities, um, those computational methods, often coined as uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, those data-driven um, methods we have now and that are much more, that are much more flexible um, in the use and that are able to um, work in more dynamic environments. So those, that's where these capabilities come from but we don't talk about any form of like um, artificial general intelligence or machines that can understand intent and are human-like intelligent or superhuman or whatever. We talk about mathematical capabilities for certain tasks in certain contexts. That's important to keep in mind to have sort of an expectation management there, what's possible and what's not. So that's the what are we talking about issue. Now, why do we talk about this? Why is this so, spe so special with regard to warfare and weapon systems? And actually, we have quite a few opportunities, but also challenges or even dangers coming from the decline of the human element in there. Mm. I will briefly go through various fields um, there. There will be the military part, of course, but also legal questions, ethical ones, security fa uh, questions and a bit of the economic factor in there as well. Military, for military first. Um, if you look, or the reason why you want to include autonomous functions in weapon systems is that there are a lot of military operational advantages behind this. They can be, or they can bring much more speed to the targeting process. Um, they can allow to withdraw the human for the so-called dull, dirty and dangerous tasks, it's 3D. Uh, tasks and bring a whole set of new options with them. So you could act in secluded areas, for example, where you don't have a communication link, where you can't, for example, use a remotely piloted drone. You could send in something with um, autonomous functions in those regards and have it acting there on its own. You could also have more risky options um, as well. So those are very interesting new military um, uh, options there. But of course, they come, come at a certain cost of everything. Um, one would be um, the cyber dimension, so hacking and all this. Uh, of course, you could also hack a remotely piloted drone. It becomes much more interesting if you hack the database that trains the algorithm for an autonomous system, uh, because then you, ha you have the whole fleet you know, possibly under your control or at least not functioning in a certain way. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, it could lead to a certain conflict escalation I me uh, mentioned already, increasing speed, which is a good thing at the one side. It could also lead to escalation on the other side, um, especially if you have two uh, systems with autonomous functions, uh, you know, adversary system uh, coming, uh, working, uh, fighting each other. So cyber conflict escalation. And of course, if you um, don't have enough human control, there is always a risk that you just don't uh, get, your, get to your operational goal that you might have fratricide and all this. So there's an in, uh, inherent military interest in keeping human control to a certain extent. On a higher level, um, of course, it might also um, influence military structures like command structures. What happens if you don't need certain humans in this targeting loop? Um, that's something to, to think about who's responsible there 
how do we keep responsibility and ac accountability um, in the military structures. It also has implications for training and all that. I won't go into this, but it's just, just by removing the human in certain, uh, certain tasks, uh, you will have definitely uh, opportunities and challenges in the mili military realm. And, of course, as always, there are a lot of legal issues as well. Um, first of all, international humanitarian law. You have all these principles of distinction, of proportionality, uh, of military necessity, and those are quite abstract terms that you have to apply to certain situations. Um, and as, at least for now, machines can't do that because you need to understand the operational context uh, something is happening in. Um, but even if they could, if machines were technically capable of doing this and would be all fine, they can uh, detect civilians and protect them or know what's proportional and what's not, um, there might be still a problem that you need or the challenge that you need a human as a subject of law to make these legal decisions. You can't maybe just, you can't leave this to a machine that's disputed. Of course, it's law, it's disputed. Um, but that's one, one aspect to keep in mind there. I already mentioned the accountability and responsibility questions. I think there are solutions to this. Um, so it's not such a big issue, but still keeping in mind that uh, everyone from the, uh, the person that, uh, the programmer that creates the algorithm or the database up to the commander who decides to use those weapons that they might uh, be different and often difficult to identify responsibilities there. The arms control issue has been mentioned before. It's not, not easy when you, I mentioned that we talk about the human machine relation. We talk, don't talk about platforms. So if we want arms control for that, what are we actually regulating here? Uh, it's a bit unusual to have to regulate a process and a relation <laughs> and something abstract like this, so that's a program for, for arms control um, and something we currently discuss at the uh, United Nations uh, Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons Systems. Also really fun with verification and all that, so there's a huge, uh, uh, a huge uh, subject <laughs> behind this as well. Uh, how do you legally verify software in, um, with regard to arms control? That's the legal part. There are also huge ethical, maybe opportunities, but especially challenges as I see it. Um, so if we see that a machine can be better than a human in certain situations, we might actually have like, like an obligation to use this machine um, there, um, especially from a consequentialist perspective. If you can save uh, more lives, uh, with, or more civilian lives, for example, with uh, autonomous functions in an operation, you might be obliged to use it. On the other hand, we have a huge problem with human dignity there. Um, if you take out the human from all these steps in the targeting cycle, the target becomes an object. It becomes a data point in there. It's, of course, a machine may be able to distinguish between that's kind of a human thingy and that's an object. I'm supposed to take the human, I will do this. But it doesn't understand what a human is, what it means to take a life um, for example, it won't recognize that, and that's a fundamental problem and might violate the dignity of the target, be it a civilian or a soldier. Um, and for some, that would be the red line. We can't go there. For others, um, I, I had this discussion, uh, for others, it's okay if you can save more human lives, as I said, the consequentialist perspective. And that's something to, to discuss and to keep in mind, but I think there's a fundamental ethical problem there if you don't have sufficient level or whatever of your control. A few more sentences on the security issues. Um, autonomous functions can possibly uh, have a deterring effect because they are faster and have all these uh, interesting new options, especially in combination with other weapons, hypersonics, nuclear, whatever. Um, but they can also lead to arms races and we can see this already. Um, like investments in the military sector, but also in the private sector. And August mentioned it yesterday in his keynote speech, um, that there is a certain financial incentive in this arms race, possibly, because you have this huge private sector developing, developing all those sensors, processes, a lot of the software you need for those autonomous functions in there. So it might be interesting to support them and then use those or adapt those to military needs. 
And that's something we can definitely see already um, happening. So, a lot of interesting new questions, no answers given here. Um, in those 10 minutes, what I want you to keep in mind for the discussion is that we do not talk about a generally intelligent, super intelligent machine. We talk about functions for certain tasks in certain contexts. And we talk about human control that needs to be defined in itself by a set of minimum requirements and the context, but it's about the human-machine relation here. Thank you. human and machine. <laughs> My own human machine interface has just failed. So, uh, uh, Anya, thank you very much indeed. What a tour de force that was, uh, and on time, and you, you, you did as promised. Um, uh, I was most struck by uh, a comment you made at the beginning and then re repeated at the end, which is that actually at the heart of this whole discussion is and must be um, this idea of a, of a relationship between the human and the machine. And this is in itself, these, those words themselves are quite challenging, aren't they? Um, I do a little bit of work, a tiny bit of work, in comparison to yours, on, on, on AI, and I've done something with, uh, with Kinetic uh, in the UK. Um, and, and they have a, 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 I think it's on LinkedIn or on Twitter or something, uh, but it's a, it's a discussion group coming up on, uh, or developing on, on, the, on the subject of AI and the human-machine human relationship, um, which I think is, uh, could be quite interesting, worth following if you're interested in it. Kinetic is the most irritating um, term in the, well, not English language, but anyway, whatever language it, it was invented in. It's Q-I-N-E-T-I-Q, -I -I if you want to follow it. Um, but the point of that story is that I, it struck me that what's at, at the heart of the human-machine relationship is another even more intangible problem, which is how, you, how can you get a relationship of trust between a, a, human, per, a human individual and a, and a machine that, as it were, you've just uh, constructed. So, yeah, but thank you very much for that. Um, excellent. Um, an excellent introduction to a vastly complicated um, topic. 